I probably hit about over a thousand forehands a day. I'm a perfectionist, so I like to get everything pretty spot on. This level of dedication has enabled Freya to develop her sport to the very highest level. But such sustained activity has also left its mark on her body. And what's interesting about tennis is that we can see exactly how her body has adapted and learned. Because tennis divides the body in two. Whether it's serving at 100 kilometers an hour or smashing forehands down the line, powerful impact forces are experienced far more frequently by Freya's racket arm. And that level of force causes some surprising one-sided changes to the skeleton that we are only just beginning to uncover. While her body looks symmetrical from the outside, the bones in her racket arm are 20% thicker and contain more bone mineral than her other arm. Her joints act like shock absorbers, taking up the extreme forces her arm experiences repeatedly as she hits her shots. These forces are transferred from muscle along her tendons to her arm bones. Freya's skeleton has learned to cope with her intense daily workouts by growing dramatically in order to reduce the risk of breaking. Tennis players, we have to really focus on uh, keeping the balance right. If you get too much on one side, then it can really throw things off. In fact, we all have small differences in the size of the bones in our arms, because everyone tends to favor one arm over the other. But recent studies have shown that the differences in tennis players are about 10 times greater than in non-players. And it's not just our bones that adapt and learn to deal with the stresses and strains of life. It's our muscles as well. Muscles that will need to be on top form to beat Andrea Petkovic, a former world top 10 player. Muscles also learn from the activities we do every day. In fact, Skeletal muscle is the most adaptable tissue in the human body. Muscle fiber cells contain more than one nucleus. When muscles are worked hard, special satellite cells are activated. They divide. One of these cells then fuses with the muscle fiber itself. Now, with added nuclei, the muscle fiber cell builds more myofibrils, increasing the size of both itself and our muscles, giving Freya more power for her shots. But in the end... Experience wins over power. When we take a breath, we are introducing tens of thousands of pathogens into our lungs. With a surface area the size of a tennis court, this is the main battleground in our fight against infection. And crucial to this battle is our lymphatic system, a complex network of vessels and nodes. When pathogens land on the lung lining, their presence attracts the attention of special white blood cells, dendrocytes. They don't attack the invader themselves, Instead, they take a sample of the pathogen and carry it back via the lymph vessels to a lymph node, which holds a kind of library of responses to pathogens we've encountered in the past. If the sample is recognized, this triggers the production of custom-made antibodies designed specifically to target the invader, which flood into the bloodstream in their billions. These latch on to the invading pathogen 
effectively smothering it and killing it. Our immune system tirelessly patrols our bodies, keeping pathogens at bay. But on the rare occasions they manage to penetrate our defences, the invaders are faced with perhaps the most powerful hunter-killers in our body's armoury. And at the University of Manchester, Professor Dan Davis is making groundbreaking discoveries about these hunter-killers, our natural killer cells. Um, if you said, what does a natural killer cell look like? I'd go, oh, it must be covered in vicious spikes and, and look totally menacing, which it does. Some of those spikes would be part of the way in which it senses the presence of other cells. If another cell touched that region, then these spikes would sense the presence of a cell and then the cell would move over. We have around 10,000 of these natural killer cells in every drop of our blood. These are what we rely on to fight off colds and flu when they've infected our cells. Dan uses advanced microscope technology to watch the cells in action. We've taken um, cells out of someone's blood and we've isolated these particular white blood cells, natural killer cells, uh, and we've coloured them blue. And then these are virus-infected cells, green, and we're watching them now live as the natural killer cells move around this dish. And you can see that it sticks onto that virus-infected cell and you can see killing it as it turns from green to red. When the blue cell grabs the green one, there, there does seem to be this very physical struggle, and then that sudden change to red. And that natural killer cell, that white blood cell, is particularly good at killing this cell, so it's now killed another one. So it's sequentially moving on from one infected cell to another one to another one, and each time it's killing it, and it's turning from green to red. Many scientists think that there is a maximum human lifespan of around 120 years. And that might be because adult human stem cells can only divide a finite number of times. So there's a limit to the body's capacity for repair. But what if there was a way of manipulating stem cells, of taking them back to the beginning, of rewinding their clocks so that growth could continue? Dr. Harold Ott, a Harvard researcher, is doing something that only a few years ago was looked on as science fiction. He's working to extend the life of our stem cells, to trick them into growing long after their natural lifespan. Operating at the very limits of our scientific knowledge, he's trying to produce lab-grown human organs for transplant. What exactly are you doing, Harold? Well, what, Chris, what you're looking at here is a human heart donated for research. The human heart is a complex structure and one that would be almost impossible to grow from scratch in the lab. We flush the organ with detergent to remove all cells from this heart by using the organ's own vascular system. So where blood would normally flow through the muscle, now detergent is flowing through and that's stripping the cells away. Exactly. Dr. Ott is left with a protein shell. All the capillaries and structure of the heart is preserved. But without functioning cells, the heart can't do its job. It's a bit like an office without staff. It looks the same, but it lacks the vital components to become functional. So the next job is to use stem cells to seed this structure with healthy heart cells. Because what you're looking at here is uh, one of those scaffolds that is mounted in a bioreactor that enables us to perfuse it with nutrients and seed it with cells. The heart muscle cells, we get them into it by injecting them directly into it. Every one to two millimeter, so there's hundreds of injections. Stem cells have one big limitation. They can only divide into predetermined cells. 
So for example, skin stem cells can only produce skin cells. But in 2008, a Japanese scientist called Shinya Yamanaka made a major breakthrough. He took normal adult skin cells and turned back time. He tricked them into becoming embryonic stem cells, cells that can become any cell of the human body. And it's these that Dr. Ott uses to turn into heart cells. So why aren't we there yet? I mean, it sounds to me like you've built a heart. So. While we have something that's the shape of a heart and that has all the necessary components, we now have to help these components to come together. Teach the heart muscle cells to become heart muscle. If you think of the fetal heart as it develops, very early on, the heart muscle cells are exposed to stress and strains to that moving environment. That's why we apply stretch and electrical stimulation to over time help mature these cells into something that's much closer to you or my heart. Do you think within our lifetimes we will see this heart in, in the jar move to a human body and be functioning? Well, that's what I hope for. Yeah. If you know anything about sleep, you probably know that there are two types. There's REM sleep where we dream, there's deep sleep where we don't and we mostly know that we should try and get more of it. But scientists like Scott here are discovering there's a huge amount more to it than that. Well, actually, scientists have demonstrated that there are five different stages of sleep. It's achieving some vital functions that just can't be achieved during wakefulness. And one of those critical functions is to help us remember. Scott believes that during sleep, the brain selects which memories to strengthen and which to lose. Rustic. To show this, I have to create new memories that can be tested later. So what I'm doing here, what I'm meant to be doing here, is making associations between the word and the picture. So here, for example, it says the word artistic, the computer says artistic, and there's a picture of a hairdresser. So I have to make a mental link between artistic and hairdressers. This is military, and there's a potato peeler. So maybe soldiers carrying potato peelers. And Scott assures me this is one of the more interesting experimental psychology tests, so I shouldn't fall asleep during the test. Exotic microwaves. Okay. And as Scott tucks me in for the world's most unnatural nap, it's time to let my brain get to work. All right, am I good to go? Yep, you're good to go. So uh, we'll be back in about 90 minutes and uh, just try and relax and enjoy some sleep, okay? Lovely. All right, I'll see, I'll see you in an hour or so. Yeah, and you? It helped. I've been looking forward to this all week. Scott's looking for the phase of sleep he thinks is critical for memory. OK, so we're seeing some really nice, consistent um, deep sleep here, some really nice, consistent slow waves within the EEG. So I think we're in a good position, actually, to reactivate some memories. Um, it's a very simple push of a button. Surgical. Delicate. To demonstrate what happens to us every night during slow wave sleep, some of the words I learned earlier are played to me over a loudspeaker to see if I can remember them better. Abundant. Extreme. And all too quickly, I'm rudely awoken from my nap. Hey, Chris, are you awake? Hello. Mm. It's like the world's worst hotel, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can I turn down your electrodes? Then, a quick test. Perfumed bird. I can't remember. What's amazing is that it was easier for me to recall the word associations that were played to me during sleep. Alpine. This fits into Scott's wider results that show memory performance is much higher in those that sleep compared to those that take the test without sleeping. There were quite a few examples of words that popped up that were suddenly, very surprisingly to me, I could remember them. So we reactivated a specific word and then your brain um, strengthened a connection between that word and the associated picture. 
We think what one of the main things that slow wave sleep is doing is actually eradicating all of the irrelevant information that we don't need. But the other thing that slow wave sleep is doing is strengthening the important information. So those memories of things that we need to remember are being reactivated and strengthened so that we're less likely to forget them after sleep. The level of fear we feel in any particular situation is driven by a complex process in our brains that we're only just beginning to fully understand. Phobias are an example of a fear response that's running out of control. Here at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, they're trying to help people with phobias. And by studying the intricate neural mechanisms involved in fear, they've discovered a way we might be able to control them. OK, so we will start the first test. You will see images. This will go on for around six minutes. Professor Frederick Ars looks at how people's brains respond when they're shown a series of images. <laughs> When they see something they're scared of, the scanner picks up activity in the part of our brain that processes emotions, the amygdala. OK, so this is the amygdala lighting up in subjects who are afraid of the picture they're looking at in the right. scanner. The amygdala lets you respond to things very quickly, even before you're consciously aware that you see something that's dangerous. Remarkably, part of our unconscious brain, the amygdala, is responding nearly half a second before we consciously perceive the threat. It's a shortcut that allows the body to be primed for action without having to wait for our conscious brain to fully assess the situation. But this powerful instinctive response is only useful if it can be controlled. And that requires another part of the brain. Then, <clears throat> once you're aware of it, the prefrontal cortex, which is uh, in front of your brain, can come along. And this part tells the amygdala to quieten down. So is that what bravery is? Is this bravery, basically? Is bravery your prefrontal cortex going, I know you're afraid, but we're going to do it anyway? Yeah, exactly. So you could think of <clears throat> the prefrontal cortex as being an, a rider and the amygdala as a horse. And sometimes the horse gets spooked and the rider can still control the horse. Oh, wow. Frederick and his team are using virtual reality to help people learn to control their fears. And for me, that means only one thing. Spiders. This is very weird and creepy. OK. Oh, I don't like that. Oh. Well, oh, I don't like that giant all. electronic oh. spiders. Oh. Where do they go? I'm doing that classic, like, take my feet off the ground. Yeah. <laughs> the idea is that if we're exposed to something we fear and the outcome is safe, this memory can be stored. <laughs> the prefrontal cortex can use a safe memory to initiate the calming of the amygdala and the fear response. There is a diverse community of microbes living in and on every one of us. We even have a name for it, our microbiome. And as we grow, it grows with us. The foods we eat, the places we visit, the people we interact with. Each new experience shapes our microbiome. It's as individual to us as our fingerprints. Sand, show us. We have thousands of species of bacteria living on our skin, with up to a million individual bacteria per square centimetre. And in some places, it's even more than that. One study identified over a thousand bacterial species previously unknown to science simply by swabbing people's belly buttons. And it's not just on our skin. In our digestive tract, we have trillions of bacteria. These bugs aren't just hangers-on. Studies have shown that an imbalance in our gut bacteria 
can have a huge effect on the workings of our bodies. Obesity, high blood pressure and heart disease have all been linked to a poor microbiome. It may even affect our moods, causing depression. If we're to grow and thrive, a healthy microbiome is essential. Fueled by milk and assisted by friendly bugs, by the time we're one year old, we've tripled our weight and nearly doubled our length. As the bones inside our bodies literally extend themselves. It's a gradual process that day by day we hardly notice. But the growth of our bones is one of the true wonders of the human body. A process that we now understand in intricate detail.